just uh, Ottoman uh, one, two, six um, part lab. Could you send a technician, please, and uh, start up my machine? I'm, I'm, I can't uh, pass the image. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I'm in the middle of the rest of you now. I can't speak. Okay, today we're doing the three review questions, questions two, three, and four. This is important in terms of preparing for the final exam. So, um, Last time, so, uh, there was a screw up, uh, the camera didn't work, but no matter because the review questions, will, the coverage of the review questions will basically uh, cover what I, um, what was not recorded last time. So the review questions are key. So first of all, the first uh, review question is, that we're going to look at is, why was the fall of Constantinople in 1453 a significant event? Well, uh, in answering this question, the, the most important thing to get in, uh, or to, to uh, respond is to say that the fall of Constantinople led to the opening up of the Atlantic route to Asia. And that, basically, the opening up of the land route to the sea route to Asia created the world capitalist economy. That's the basic framework for answering this question. Um, now, in terms of the uh, details, uh, you begin by talking about the fact that traditionally, uh, the Mediterranean route was the only route to Asia from Europe. And that uh, this was a difficult route, it was over land in large part, and uh, only limited amounts of goods could be moved in this, uh, over this route. Um, and that um, the <coughs> rise of the Ottomans really put this whole route into question. Uh, the uh, Ottomans, uh, who became stronger and stronger in the 14th and beginning of the 15th century, finally in 1453 they organized 
a siege of the city of Constantinople. And the fall of the city has a lot of significance because uh, it means that a new, extremely powerful uh, Islamic State has arisen in the Middle East. It covers the whole of the Middle East. It covers the Balkans, almost to the gates of Vienna. Uh, it covers southern Russia and Ukraine and ultimately North Africa. It's an enormous thing. And for the first few years after the fall of it, until about 1470, uh, European merchants, Italians, Venetians, Genoese, they could not they could not uh, move goods from, from Asia. So it was an actual closing. Um, and it was significant in the sense that uh, this, to it, the technician coming, for just a second, interrupt me. Could you, um, uh, I, I haven't been able to get that thing to work right. up there. So I, um, in terms of operating machine, this is the, uh, the front button is here, that way. That, that, that's my computer. So I put that in and it should come up. This is the um, green here, up and down. Um, what about the display, this thing there? It's actually touching the button, for example. This button, this button right here? Yep. That should do it? Normally. What, what's that? Normally, yes. Yes. Right okay. now it's not going to work because that function is broken. We're waiting for David to work that. Oh, okay. that's, that's right. right. That's right. That's what I did for you. Yeah. So it's been, uh, it's been broken? It's yes. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Sorry for the interruption. In any case, um, so the rise of the Ottomans meant an interruption of this uh, for a, at least a decade or two. Uh, there was no movement of goods uh, between Asia and Europe. And um, it was all the more menacing because uh, the Ottoman state was becoming consolidated, developing an extremely powerful military and bureaucracy, and their ideology was crusade against the infidels, crusade against the Christians. Um, just as the Spaniards, the Catholics, were crusading against the Arab, uh, likewise the Ottoman state had this concept of jihad, which was more or less identical to the idea of crusade in the minds of the Christians. So all of this was very threatening. And the result was that the, even before the Con uh, Constantinople fell, but especially after it fell, the Portuguese began to try and find an alternative route. So this, so now we talk about uh, the, the Portuguese, and of course, you recapitulate what I said about um, Henry the Navigator, this prince who sponsored these voyages, Portuguese voyages down the west coast of Africa. Along the way, they, uh, they found all of these trading posts, and in particular, in the offshore islands, the Azores, the Cape Verde, San Tome, they create these sugar plantations, which are become extremely valuable and become the model for the sugar plantations uh, of the Europeans in Brazil and in the Caribbean. Uh, and of course, all of this is based on growing numbers of black slave labor, slave, the slave trade basically comes into existence as a result of this activity. And then you move on and you say, well, then um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the next step is um, the uh, discovery of the route around the Cape of Good Hope by Diaz and Vasco da Gama. They reach, um, they reach India, um, and uh, this uh, then is, is the completion of the essay. You, you basically conclude by saying, uh, "Well, uh, 
this uh, reaching of India now opens up um, a permanent uh, alternative route through the Mediterranean, and it creates the world capitalist economy. That's the conclusion of the essay. So that's uh, um, review question two. Now, the, the next question um, asks you to compare the Portuguese empire to the Spanish empire, uh, the, these two great Iberian empires, the Portuguese empire, um, which we've, the, uh, the uh, founding of which we've just discussed, and then the uh, Spanish Empire. So let's talk, first of all, about the Portuguese Empire, the nature of it. Well, the key here is population. Uh, Portugal had about 900,000 people. And uh, this uh, discovery of this new uh, route uh, through the Atlantic to Asia was an enormous boom to the Portuguese but they simply didn't have the population to take full advantage of it. And um, the consequence was that their empire, such as it was, could only be a merchant empire in contrast to the, the landed empire, which was created by the Spaniards. The essential contrast is between a country with 900,000 people, and Spain with between 12 and 14 million people, uh, most of whom are peasants who can become soldiers and settlers, as well as, of course, the nobility, which uh, dominates uh, Spanish society. So the contrast is between a landed empire composed of settlers and essentially a merchant empire on the fringe of Asia. It cannot conquer land, but rather the merchant of the Portuguese empire is based on a series of trading posts and forts because they don't have the personnel uh, to do anything else. And the, um, the Portuguese empire, um, um, as a result of the lack of population, even manning this empire and finding the resources to keep it going proved an extremely difficult task. In fact, the internal economy of Portugal, while the empire was extending, the internal economy, the agriculture, and whatever industry there was, was undermined by this effort. And making this uh, even more difficult was the fact that they there was a Jewish population. Uh, these were merchants. And uh, as I explained previously, they were expelled in 1497. So uh, that made it difficult. And you can see the difficulty from the fact that within a few years after creating the empire, the Portuguese had to turn to the Germans, who at this moment, that is to say, at the very beginning of the 16th century, they were the most powerful country economically in Europe. It was there that capitalism was really getting going in Germany. And I'll explain about that later, or you can see in uh, my book how powerful Germany was. Well, they had to turn to German capitalists, literally, to, to uh, provide them with loans in order to sort of uh, buy the goods. They, they weren't able to manufacture the goods. They had to bring German goods to Portugal to ship uh, to Asia in order to do business. So uh, in back of the Portuguese are the Germans. Um, and you can see this further, their, their weakness, the Portuguese weakness, in the fact that they were not able, despite their efforts, they set up all kinds of forts at strategic points, like at the mouth of the Red Sea, the mouth of the uh, the uh, Persian Gulf forts, which were meant to sort of block off the Mediterranean route and make the Portuguese route more important. They were unable to uh, control the Asian merchants. They were unable to control the Ottomans and the Venetians. And so 
their control of Asia was tentative, is what I'm getting at. And you can see this too, even from the fact that the Portuguese began to intermarry with the local populations. Goa, which was the capital of the Portuguese empire on the west coast of India, Goa, the city of Goa, G-O-A. Well, the Portuguese married into um, sort of distinguished Indian families, what we call the high castes in Goa. Uh, they quickly intermarried with, uh, with uh, the local Indian population because they didn't have the manpower. And they even went so far as as they set up these forts all over Asia, they they shanghaied various Chinese and Malayan um, working people to work the ships because they didn't have enough manpower to work the ships that they were operating um, in the Far East. And as I also ex wrongly explained, although the Jews were expelled, there were secret Jews who basically operated part of the Portuguese empire in Brazil, for example, or in the Caribbean. Uh, there's these so-called Baranos or crypto Jews um, who professed externally Christianity, but in fact were not Christians, played a secret role in the Portuguese empire. So that's the Portuguese empire. Now look at the Spanish empire. Spain, as, as I said, has between uh, 12 and 14 million people. Um, uh, most of these people are peasants who can be recruited into the new Spanish army. Remember I said the Spanish state is consolidating and they're creating this new infantry. It comes from the peasantry. And on top of them, of course, are the nobles um, who are the so-called conquistadors. They lead the invasion of Latin America, people like Cortez or Balboa or Pizarro, they come from um, lesser members of the Spanish nobility. But the Spanish are there in gradually and steadily increasing numbers. They, uh, Spaniards who are not making well uh, or out well in Spain, they migrate to Latin America and they become the new ruling class. These are the uh, people called peninsulars or peninsulares who become a kind of white ruling class over the rest of the, the indigenous population or the mixed population of Latin America, the peninsulares. Um, and uh, I, I remember I explained that um, the merchant class, the cities, they existed and they supported the monarchy because they were afraid of the nobles. But um, they were nothing like as strong as the German middle class or the Italian middle class or even the French middle class. Um, the middle class in Spain was weak and it got weaker because they expelled their Jews in 1492. Uh, so they relied on the Genoese. I explained that Columbus and that whole enterprise is financed it, the money and the connections, the financial connections, are basically Italian. And the Genoese ran the financial administration of the Spanish state through most of the 16th century. But of course, I also stress the uh, huge importance of the Catholic Church in all of this. It is the, it is the, uh, the ideology of Catholicism which unites the Spanish people in, first of all, crusading against the Arabs and ultimately the Muslims and ultimately expelling them in 1492. And then that carries over. The conquest of the New World is a continuation of this um, crusade uh, for the Catholic Church. And as part of this, of course, um, important, both in Spain itself, but also in the New World, is the Inquisition, the Roman Catholic Inquisition, which ideologically, and indeed even politically, controls the Spanish population. Spaniards are terrified uh, that they will be brought before the Inquisition. There's this conformity that sets in. Ultimately, it's fatal. 
in terms of the uh, destiny of Spain as a country in the modern period, the conformity that was imposed by the Roman Catholic Church uh, really killed off um, a lot of the sort of vitality of Spanish society. Um, so um, uh, I think that that gives you a, um, a sense uh, then of what lay in back of the, first of all, the voyages of Columbus, and then the conquistadores with which you end the essay. Okay? So in terms of answering the essay, obviously uh, what I've said here, I've said a lot, I've said a mouthful, um, but uh, what I want to see on the, in, the, in the final essay, which will be a take-home, is as much as what, uh, of what I've said sort of recapitulated in the essay and developed maybe with a few dates and so on. Uh, that, that would make um, a, a good um, final examination question. So let's deal with the, la the third and last question of today, which is actually um, question number four. The Spaniards destroyed the Aztec and Inca empires with surprising ease. How is this possible? Well, I, I think I, uh, in the last class, actually, I, I explained. In the first place, uh, the Aztec and Inca empires were Bronze Age civilizations. Um, the Incas and the Aztecs, the people, used, uh, they knew about smelting um, copper and tin, and they were able to develop tools and and weapons which were made out of bronze. But the Spaniards had iron weapons and, uh, and iron tools. They had cannons. They had rifles. They had pistols. They had sharp swords, uh, daggers. And the weapons of the Spaniards were far more powerful than those of the Incas and the Aztecs. That's very important. And I would say that that goes uh, even deeper because there is a huge contrast between the sort of organizational capacity of Iron Age populations as compared to Bronze Age uh, people. The, the Spaniards were extremely well organized. They were able to build these fantastic ships, these, um, these warships, um, which... Um, were uh, way superior, uh, based on the sophisticated technology, which the uh, Inca and uh, Aztec population uh, had no, no sense of. They used canoes, if they used anything, uh, in Latin America. So there's that. But I think uh, what we have to understand is that there is uh, the, the coming in of the Spaniards, the coming in of this Iron Age technology, there was a shock, a shock, in terms of the contact between this, these uh, sophisticated Iron Age Spaniards and the indigenous Bronze Age populations. Certainly the Aztec and Inca empires were civilization, but they were Bronze Age. They did have cities. They did have an agriculture. They did have monumental buildings. They did have a state. But the the the, uh, the Spaniards were at a different stage of development, uh, a much more powerful stage of development than were the indigenous people, and that helps to explain their success. But also, um, I noted the fact that the indigenous people, uh, in the tens of millions, the Spaniards, uh, particularly at the beginning, were few in number. If they had been united, it would have been a different story, but they were deeply divided. Indeed, um, as I explained, the Aztecs were hated by large numbers of the indigenous uh, populations in Mexico because they were oppressors. Um, uh, they extracted tribute, including human sacrifice, and I stress that, as a way of controlling the population. The, Aztec, the Aztecs didn't have a bureaucracy. They had uh, terror, and they had uh, they, they allied with various tribes. Well, many of the tribes were opposed to them, 
and they went with the Spaniards. So the divisions. And the last point, of course, is the disease. Um, European diseases killed off millions of uh, the indigenous in the New World, especially in the 16th century. It's estimated that it was not until um, the, the middle of the 19th century that the indigenous population in Latin America reached the level it was at before the coming of the Spaniards. In other words, the die-off of the indigenous population was enormous, and it obviously weakened them and made them vulnerable to attack. So that basically um, would be the answer to uh, that particular question. So having uh, dealt with that, I want to now um, go back to the narrative, go back to the narrative. And what I'm going to do uh, uh, in the first part of the narrative is basically give you a deeper sense of what Aztec culture, what, what Aztec uh, culture and what Inca culture was like. I'm going to briefly outline the highlights of Aztec civilization and then Inca civilization. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the Spanish colonial administration. Because, of course, we, we want to know uh, something about uh, the way the Aztecs and the Incas lived. But also, we have to realize that the Spanish Empire was uh, long-lived. It lasted a long time. It lasted from the time of Columbus down to the beginning of the 19th century um, until the coming of the French Revolution. Um, Spain controlled this, uh, this uh, enormously wealthy empire in the New World. Uh, which helps to explain its power. So, first of all, the Aztecs. Let's talk about the, um, the Aztecs. Um, the, um, well, um, um, the, uh, the Aztecs controlled Mexico, and um, Mexico consisted of... Uh, millions of people, most of whom were farmers, organized in tribes, but they lived, uh, many of them lived in cities and towns. And many of these cities were larger than the cities in Spain, which bespeaks, which reflects the fact that the food output, the surpluses of food that were produced by the people living in Mexico at that time was very large. It could support a large urban population. Um, and uh, of course there was a state system. There was a class system. The Aztecs were essentially the ruling class over the, um, the subordinated populations. And the subordinate populations had to deliver uh, based on a kind of calendar and the Aztec calendar was quite sophisticated, a calendar, and they had to deliver food uh, and other uh, products that they made to the Aztec rulers who lived. And of course, they, the Aztecs intimidated people by practicing, um, uh, taking hostages and killing large numbers. I saw recently that, for example, in 1487, it's estimated that something like the Aztecs actually sacrificed in the capital, Tenochtitlan, today's Mexico City, some 90,000 young women and young women and men uh, to their gods. This was said to be the only way that the gods could be propitiated, could be uh, satisfied. Um, and um, so... Um, um, it was a system which was oppressive and exploitative. And I explained that that's why it set the stage for the success of Cortez. In any case, uh, we still today have, we can see in, if you go to Mexico, you can see the monumental temples 
and palaces that were left uh, by the Aztec rulers, built at their command. They knew how to write. Um, they kept, as I said, a very elaborate calendar. Um, and uh, so this was a sophisticated um, population. But you have to realize that the Aztecs actually had invaded, they were a tribe up in the United States, up in Texas and New Mexico. Uh, there was a tribe known as the Mexiques, hence the name Mexico, that came down, that raided into Mexico, and that, uh, in fact, this area had had successive civilizations dating back to 2000 BC. It was very old. The Aztecs were only the last, the latest, of the rulers over this Mexican um, uh, Mesoamerican civilization. Um, now, uh, I, I want to say a little bit about uh, the human sacrifice business. Um, I, I think that um, um, this was uh, absolutely a critical part of the Aztec religion. And I, I, I particularly stressed, obviously it was meant to guarantee the harvest, the rains. It was a way of propitiating nature. Somehow they, they uh, pushed the idea that uh, human blood was this, the, the, the uh, um, access to human blood was critical. Pouring human blood was critical to maintaining proper relationship with the gods that the Aztecs believed in. Uh, and this was all done by a kind of temple ritual on top of these great pyramids that I, I think you probably uh, have seen. Uh, but um, the Spaniards, who of course were Catholics, um, and the Europeans were astonished and appalled by, um, by when they learned about this, and it, the suppression of, or the conquest of the Aztecs, the Spaniards saw this as civilizing, uh, a civilizing process. They were bringing the indigenous population to civilization. And of course, I think it's justified to see this um, practice as, um, as inhumane. It's obviously inhumane. Um, and I think we can use that absolute categories to do this. That's my view of it. But uh, I, I just want to bring your attention to the fact that there was a, an American anthropologist, very important, who taught at Columbia and who really founded uh, the discipline of anthropology in North America. His name was Boas, B-O-A-S, B-O-A-S. And he was the guy who invented the concept of cultural relativism, culture, which is a kind of key concept in anthropology, but even beyond anthropology. I just want to mention this concept. And then basically the concept holds that we can't use our categories. We belong to a culture, a certain culture. We should not apply the categories of our culture to an understanding or even a judgment of what other cultures do. This is the doctrine of cultural relativism. And I think it's an important doctrine because it enables uh, uh, investigators to study other cultures, other civilizations in an objective way by uh, not imposing your own values directly. But I, I guess because the, the uh, concept of uh, human sacrifice is a bit hard to process. Nevertheless, I would say that uh, I think one should understand cultural relativism as a methodology and that it should not preclude ultimately uh, uh, the, uh, making uh, some sort of philosophical and moral judgment about other people's behavior. I think the two have to go together. One has to be a cultural relativist. You, understand other people, but it, uh, it doesn't preclude the idea of making a, finally some sort of a, a judgment which does involve moral um, criteria. That's what I would say about uh, human sacrifice by the Aztecs.
Now, I want to emphasize the fact that uh, this was a very rich civilization. Uh, they produced enormous amounts of food uh, in Mexico and um, of a, a great variety. So that, to give you an idea, it was in Mexico, it, it was in Mexico or in the New World, especially in Mexico, that the Europeans found for the first time corn. Corn was uh, unknown in Europe, but also squash, potatoes, chilies, tomatoes, peanuts, chocolate, cocoa, a vast variety of food. And these foods, these new foods, unknown in Europe, unknown in Asia, in the 16th century, they spread within a matter of a few decades to both Asia and to Europe. And they enormously enhanced the diet and the cuisine of both the Europeans and the people of Asia. Uh, so th this is uh, uh, an important uh, um, aspect of what the discovery of the New World meant. Now, because uh, so much surplus was produced, the, the Aztecs um, were, uh, many were able to live in cities. There was a class system. Many people could live without engaging in agriculture. And there was a differentiation of occupation. That is to say, people living in cities, they made a living by making shoes or by weaving, um, spinning and weaving cloth uh, or by making furniture. In other words, there were a whole series of other occupations. And the result was that um, uh, Mexico under the Aztecs produced um, great works of art, their monumental architecture. Their statues, their pottery, have remained as uh, major achievements in the world history of art. And as a matter of fact, when Mexico underwent a revival at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a huge revival of, we can say, of, of uh, Mexican culture and a huge attempt on the part of the of the Mexicans who were undergoing their own revolution at the beginning of the 20th century to recover the achievements of the earlier indigenous civilization, including uh, the Aztec, that many of these objects that I'm speaking about, objects of art, were recovered and they have become part of the inheritance of the Mexican people. And I did a list in the, under maps and illustrations, I gave you um, this painting by Diego Rivera, who was really the leader of this Mexican revival. And he produced a lot of paintings, which basically are representations, historical representations, very accurate of this earlier Aztec civilization. So there is this a uh, modern component to uh, my description of Aztec civilization. Now, I want to move on to the Incas. And many of the things I've said about the, uh, the uh, Aztecs are true of the, uh, the Incas. It was, a civil, it was a great civilization, bound, of course, in Peru and Bolivia. Um, of course, they didn't practice human sacrifice. Um, and the, the really distinctive and significant part of what is of interest about the Incas, although they certainly were, the Incas, like the Aztecs, had originated as a tribal group. The Incas were a definite tribal group, and they conquered in the 13th century, just like the Aztecs. They came in from an outlying area of this region, and they conquered an earlier civilization, because we see that this Andes civilization, this civilization based on the mountains of Bolivia and Peru, 
goes back, just like the Aztec civilization, to at least 2000 BC. There is this antiquity to uh, Inca civilization. But the distinctive thing was their social welfare system. Unlike the Aztecs who just took, who just oppressed and exploited, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but the, the Inca elite gave something back, and I, I'll, I'll deal with that in a minute. Um, in any case, um, the, the, the Incas were the ruling class. This is a class system. Uh, they lived off the tribute which the common people, the peasants, and the under tribes had to deliver to, uh, to the Inca elite who considered themselves the owners of this empire. They, of course, had friends. They had certain tribes amongst the peoples, millions who lived. Uh, some tribes were friendly to them. Other tribes were hostile. Um, well, um, the difference between the Aztecs and the Incas was that, as I said, the rulers gave something back because this, uh, one of the amazing features of the Inca civilization is that unlike uh, Mexico, which is essentially agricultural land, flat land and so on, uh, this civilization emerged largely in the mountains. Great hills and mountains of Bolivia and Peru are the foundation. And so to, make, to create roads, to create farmland, to create irrigation works uh, is enormously laborious. And the Incas made it their business to sustain and develop this very elaborate system of irrigation works, of roadways, which linked people together. And they went further than that. They ordered all across the empire that warehouses be established, which would store foods so that in times of flood or um, uh, drought or other natural difficulties, the people would have the wherewithal to live. So there were special, all over the empire, there were these special warehouses that made, I guess uh, you would call them food banks. We have, um, since the onset of neoliberalism, we have food banks. Well, that's what the Incas did way back uh, in the past. Indeed, they, as part of the way they, at least their official ideology, they said that, um, that uh, uh, everybody in the, em uh, in the empire should be guaranteed food and clothing, food and clothing. Now, the amazing thing about the Incas was that unlike the Aztecs, who used cocoa beans as their money, you can imagine such a thing, the Incas had no money. Uh, they, did, they did not uh, use money. Everything was done in terms of bartering, the barter was used in order to exchange goods, or uh, people established permanent kinship relations with other people. The mountain people who produced, say, wool for clothing would basically intermarry with people who live closer to the sea, and they would exchange. They had these elaborate systems of exchange between the, the mountain people, the valley people, the people who lived the shore, and they would exchange goods based on these kinship relationships. There would be periods when they would bring the fish up into the mountains and so on, or provide a wool to the people who lived down near the coast. Uh, this reciprocity was a, uh, one of the bases of the uh, Inca civilization. Sorry, uh, so um, that gives you some sense of what the Incas were like. So now I want to uh, terminate this lecture by having described the Aztecs and the uh, Incas. I want to talk about the way once the Spaniards had conquered um, the uh, Mexico and Peru, how did they 
uh, did they uh, administer uh, this empire? Well, uh, it was it from Madrid, of course, from Spain. From, uh, Madrid was the capital. There was a royal palace called the Escorial, and the Spanish king basically controlled the empire from there. And particular important in terms of the um, the way it worked was um, Seville, the city of uh, Seville, which is a magical city, a uh, very very beautiful city, and it is beautiful because it was uh, basically the place from which all of the voyages between Spain and Latin America occurred. Um, that um, uh, it was from uh, from Madrid and Seville that the empire was run. But as I already have explained, there were the peninsularis, the Spaniards, who were white. They were the ones who basically provided the soldiers, the administrators, and the priests. The church hierarchy was basically Spanish, and they were, they ruled over the rest of the population. And uh, basically, um, the way it worked was that the Spanish, um, in the Spanish monarchy, uh, basically did this deal with the, with the, uh, the conquistadors, the conquerors, and the deal was, we give you land, and we give you control over the indigenous peoples of the empire, and in return you convert these people to the Catholic faith. That's your responsibility. So the conquistadors became the governors, the landlords, and they, in this way, were able to exploit the labor of the indigenous population. And in return, the idea was that the Roman Catholicism would become the religion, and it did become the religion, um, of the, the indigenous population, although, and historians are investigating this, there was a lot of survival of the indigenous religious culture, and it, there was a continuous sort of resistance on the part of the indigenous people. They had their secret rituals, uh, their practices based on the old gods. A lot of this survived. And indeed, some of it became incorporated into the Roman Catholic faith. So there was this indigenous resistance uh, that we have to uh, bear in mind. But below this level of government in this system is known as the encomienda system. It's not that important to know. Uh, below this, the Spanish elite began to develop ranches and plantations called hacienda the big Spanish landlord, the conquistadors, and others of noble origin, white people, they became the, the landlord class. They ran hacienda, ranches and plantations, worked by indentured indigenous labor, uh, which produced uh, things like livestock, or produced uh, various kinds of tropical products, which were uh, most of which were exported back to Europe, alongside the gold and the silver, particularly the silver. Now, that brings me, so I've talked about the, the sort of uh, governor class who uh, basically uh, were converting the people and who had overall control of the land, then I've spoken about the ranchers and plantation owners. And finally, we talk about the silver mines, both in Mexico and in Bolivia, which are still operating. They're huge. And in the 16th century, 40,000 workers worked the silver mines in Bolivia, you can imagine, but basically paid a kind of pittance wage based on peace, uh, peace rates. Uh, for their labor. And so that was the nature of the economy. And I would say that most of the wealth basically was controlled by this upper class, and a lot of it made its way to Spain. 
Um, uh, Europe developed in part out of this continuous stream of wealth, including the gold and silver that came from the New World. I guess the last point I want to make is that uh, this, this, this setup in which Roman Catholicism was the dominant ideology, which was enforced on the people and his way of controlling them, um, uh, it, was con it became a kind of racial hierarchy, which still remains in place in Latin America. It has been diluted, certainly. I'm not pretending it, it's the same in the, 16, in the 16th or the 18th century as it is today, but uh, it's important to have a, con a sense of this because it's still a reality. The ruling class in Spain are whites who pride themselves on their direct descent from the from Spain, and they don't like intermarrying with anybody beneath them. Below them are what we can call Creoles, Creoles, and these are they're also mainly white, but they are the ranchers and plantation owners who were born in the New World. The best thing you could be was was to be a Spaniard, but then. You could be white and you could come from a family that uh, ran a plantation or a hacienda in the New World. Uh, below them were the mixed blood, the Métis, um, the Mestizo. We have Métis. They have Mestizo. That's the mixed blood people, people who are both in, they have uh, mixed um, white and indigenous. Uh, blood. And at the bottom uh, were the black slaves, black slaves who in the hundreds of thousands and the millions were brought in to do the heavy labor. Um, so then there's, um, I think I'll stop at this point. Thank you.
Thank you. Hi. 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 Uh, yeah. It's supposed to be grouped into three sections, right? Yes. Um, Just like that. Yeah. Questions to one to four, and then. Okay, so should two, we. Two, like that. So should we, we should still keep them, the questions separate, like don't combine the questions? No, no. no. Okay. Um, and then I was just wondering, I know you emailed and said the maximum word count was about two pages per question. Uh, I said that, yeah. but the main thing is, did you answer the question? Okay, that's what's most important. Yes, okay. it's not a question of, I mean, you can go on for 10 pages, and if you don't answer the question, what's the good of it? Okay. And you can you can do it in a page. Uh, like I, uh, So I just gave you the number two, but uh, I leave it to your discretion. Okay, so there's no minimum either. It's just yes. Okay. Thank you. That was the same question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.